Hi, and welcome to another episode of Piano TV. Now, how do we discuss the Goldberg variations without this being an hour long video? I don't know, we're gonna try though. So here's the thing, we're gonna talk about box Goldberg variations and we're gonna talk a little bit about the song form, theme and variations. So normally theme and variations pieces are like, they have like six or seven variations, but the Goldberg variations have 30. So. The total time it takes to play through this whole thing on the keyboard would be anywhere between an hour to an hour and a half. So it is a lot of music to talk about. So I'm just gonna stop talking now. We're gonna just jump right in. Let's get to it. Theme and variations, or often just abbreviated to variations, is one of my favorite music forms. Like other older, more classical forms of music, such as sonatas, there's not really an equivalent in modern pop music. But anyway, the basic idea of a theme and variation is you have a theme, you have an idea, like a main tune. Um, it could be any length, generally not super, super long. And then you have a bunch of repeats of that same idea. But the catch is that all the repeats aren't identical. The repeats take the original tune and kind of like mix it up and twist it around. So in variations form, you might see changes to like a variety of things, some of which I didn't even list here, but things like harmony, melody, rhythm, orchestration, tempo, like speed, meter, like the time signature, all these things might be changed on repeats. Basically anything in the composer's imagination. So the Goldberg variations, BWV 988, is probably the most famous Baroque set of variations, with a shout out to Handel, he had some good ones too. Uh, composers from all other eras and, and throughout different points in time also wrote variations, including Mozart and Beethoven and Schubert and Brahms and some of those guys. Interestingly, we, we tend to think of classical music as this like inflexible, set in stone kind of music, but guys like Bach and Mozart and Beethoven were amazing improvisers. The variation form just in and of itself, it naturally lends itself to improvisation, right? Like you, you have this main idea, maybe that's set in stone, but then you can twist it around a bunch and do it on the spot. And that's what these guys would do with their variations. A lot of the variations that we have today are just transcriptions of live performances that they did. The Goldberg variations were published in 1741 when Bach would have been in his mid fifties. So about in the last decade of his life. And they were named after a man named Johann Goldberg, who was a super skilled keyboardist. And he was probably the person who first performed the Goldberg variations. So they were named after him. The Goldberg variations were originally written for the harpsichord, but recordings today, there's kind of like a 50, 50 split between harpsichord recordings and piano recordings, and I think both have their merits. So it's not like it's a sacrilege to listen to a piano recording of it or anything. I think they, yeah, they both have their value. We're gonna be listening to piano examples today. So our very first theme, the thing that spins off the whole rest of the variations is this initial aria. So we're gonna listen to it in just a moment here. So the only constant between all 30 variations is this bass line that you see here. And the melody changes and the speed changes and all kinds of other things change, but we always have this consistent harmony pattern throughout the piece. Okay, so let's take a listen to the first 30 seconds or so of the very, very lovely, mellow, slow aria. What I want you to do is pay close attention to the left hand bass line, which you can see here is dotted half notes. It was just the same notes that we were just looking at and see if you can hear those underneath so you can get a grip on the common thread. So we are gonna go out of order. And you probably already know, we're not gonna listen to clips of all 30 variations. Ain't nobody got time for that. But we are gonna pick out some of the notable ones to give examples and explain concepts. And all the information is gonna be linked on the blog and, and written out there if you wanna check it all out in more depth. So let's start by taking a look at the canon variations. So one pattern that Bach has in these, these 30 variations is that every third one is written in canon form, which we've talked about before on this channel. So that means variation number three is a canon, six is a canon, nine is a canon, and so on and so on and so on. But 
that, that would be too easy for Buck. Buck had to go and add an additional spin to these repeated cannons. So cannon number three is normal. It repeats on the same note that it started on. If you, just to quickly explain a cannon, if you're not caught up with that, cannons just, it's basically based on imitation. You'll hear a part and then that part is copied, usually in another hand. So if the pattern starts on a G, when it's a unison repeat, it's gonna also start on a G, just maybe a bar later. But in the sixth cannon, it starts on the second above. So if, if your cannon starts on G, this time the repeat's gonna start on an A. And then in the ninth cannon, it's gonna start on a B, and so on and so on. And he, he follows that pattern of seconds, thirds, fourths, fifths, sixths, seventh, et cetera, all the way through all the cannons in the Goldberg variations. We're gonna do these all in a row. So we're gonna listen to the first three canon sequences. We're gonna listen to variation three, six, and nine. And what I want you to listen for is to see if you can spot the canon. And you can see how Bach cleverly moves from unison notes to seconds and, and thirds. So just to explain how I, how I highlighted all this here, the yellow is the main tune, and then the yellow down here is the repeated main tune, and then the green is like a brand new tune. But you can basically see that, you you know, here we go, we start this tune and then the tune is repeated down here. So just, just to give you a, a visual for how things are overlapping. There are other patterns to be found in this set of 30 variations. So for example, after every canon, we see dances, we see genre pieces like Baroque dances, you've got a fugetta, you've got a French overture and some arias. And those are every, they come, everything in this goes in groups of three. So the other one that you see come around in the um, Goldberg variations and patterns of three are arabesques, which are really, really fast pieces. So the fifth variation, the eighth, the 11th, etc., etc., are all going to be like these fast arabesques arabesques. So basically everything kind of starts repeating in these patterns starting from the third variation. You'll see this pattern of three types of variations. You'll see a canon, a genre piece, like all these dances here, and an arabesque. And then rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat until you get to the 30th, the final variation. So now let's, let's start by taking a listen to a few clips from the arabesques. So the first arabesque we're going to listen to is variation number five. And it's, it's really, really fast. That's what Allegro Vivace essentially means. So this movement features hand crossing, which I've kind of marked down here, but it keeps going all through line two and three and throughout it. So what that means is like the left hand is constantly popping over the right hand and like going back and forth like a pendulum, which is something that Scarlatti, who was another Baroque composer, did a lot and, you know, Bach was obviously incorporating here. The next arabesque number eight also features this hand crossing. And this would have originally been written for a keyboard with, with two keyboards, like a harpsichord, where there's like the top rack and then the bottom rack. But when we try to play these on a, a one keyboard instrument, like the piano, it's a lot more difficult just because there's awkward overlapping, like in, in this number three. We're gonna listen to these all back to back. I'll have the sheet music up on the screen so you can follow along, but I just wanna explain them all first and then we'll listen to them consecutively. So I just marked down that bass line that we should be you know, keeping our ear out for because that's our common thread. But you can see in this third arabesque, all of these like kind of awkward hand overlaps and it's just really tough to play on the piano, especially because this one is Toccata style, which is even faster and even tougher than just like a standard arabesque. Thank you. 
right after the 15th variation, we hit a halfway point, and Bach knows it. So since this set of variation cycles in threes, right, you got the cannons, you got the arabesques, and then what we're looking at now, the dances, um, we have to look at this third category, the dances and, and the etc. So variation number 16 is a French overture, and it's unique within this composition because it's the only variation written in this overture style. And it's such that it feels like a like a very clear turning point in the music. And further adding to the to this point are, I'll show you here, these big opening, the, well, I just one, the big opening chord at the beginning, but there's also a similar chord at the very end of this overture. And you'll notice in French overture style, you've got an abundance of dotted rhythms and these kind of like florid, fast little melodies. So let's take a listen. So the second and final variation that we're going to listen to from the dances and etc. category is an aria. And it, it, it's kind of an etc. because an aria isn't a dance, but it's just lumped in that section along with the French overture, another aria if you get a... and then actual dances. So the reason that I really want to show you this aria, which is right here, variation number 25, is because out of the 30 variations, this is one of three that's in a minor key. It's in G minor, which you can see by the flats, and all of the other variations are in G major, one sharp. And it, this is such a beautiful variation. I love it. It's been described as having a dark passion and as being the emotional climax of the variations. And it's also been talked about as having, um, I think Glenn Gould said something like, it has an extraordinary chromatic texture which you can see look at all these sharps and flats and you can see everything's kind of moving by chromatic steps and it's just it's really lovely so let's take a listen to that The last thing that we need to listen to is the very, very last variation, the 30th, which is a quod libet, quod libet. I don't know why, I, every time I say that word, I feel like I need to say it in some accent and I don't ask. So a quod libet is a pretty fun word that means to do multiple melodies at once. So it's a lot like a canon. It's just the main difference is that quod libets are usually pop melodies of the day, like folk music. And it was basically intended as like a joke tune. I just have to share this anecdote down here with you guys because I think it's really funny. Apparently at Bach's family reunions, they would start by singing like a serious religious chorale. But once that was over, they would start singing popular songs of comic and also partly indecent content, all mixed together on the spur of the moment. And they not only could laugh over it quite wholeheartedly themselves, but it also aroused just as hearty and irresistible laughter in all who heard them. So says Bach's biographer one of. So this last variation was entirely intended to be a joke. It incorporates a variety of folk songs, including one with this very memorable lyric, cabbage and turnips have driven me away. Had my mother cooked meat, I'd have opted to stay. I mean, I'd stay for cabbage and turnips. I like cabbage and turnips. But anyway, besides the point, let's take a listen.
all for today's epic analysis of box Goldberg variations. I hope you learned something and I really do encourage you to go out and listen to the full version and even watch like a live performance of the full version. So thank you so much for watching this video. Thank you so much for everyone who helps make these videos possible. Go check us out on Patreon and you can check me out on social media and stuff. I exist on Twitter and Instagram and all those basic things and Facebook and you know the gist. Anyway, I'll catch you guys next time. So it's basically just like, well, I keep drawing ah, green in the wrong place. Erase that green.